Grace and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we see what happens when the Lord reaches out in pity and in compassion and brings healing to someone in need. This is one of the many miracles that's worked among the apostles, continuing what Jesus had been doing to confirm the fact that they were carrying that word. Jesus himself was confirmed to Israel by signs and wonders, as Peter had earlier said at his Pentecost sermon. And here he is now addressing a different audience. Perhaps there was a little overlap, but likely not too much. After this lame man was healed. The first few verses before this talk about what actually happened. How he was sitting begging for alms. And Peter and John went to pray. And he asked them for money. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but I'll give you what I've got. And then he reached out in the name of Jesus, Nazareth, rise up and walk. Holds out his hand, lifts the man up to his feet, and immediately the man is not only wobbling like a newborn calf, but he is able to leap, to jump, to skip, to hop, to celebrate fully what these legs can do, which he had not been able to do forever. He not only had the legs, had the muscle tone, but he had the muscle knowledge. An unbelievable healing. I know a number of you have been in walkers or crutches or stuck in a wheelchair or otherwise unable to fully get around for a while. I know it's happened to me more than once. And when it first comes that you can start walking, that walk can be pretty wobbly. I was seven weeks and a non-weight-bearing cast. And my leg looked about as puny as my arm. And I was afraid to do anything on it for a time. And I would take a little step, drag the other leg along, a little step, drag the other leg along. I didn't have what this man had. I didn't have either the muscles or the confidence to use those muscles. And I had to have one or the other before I could get the other one going. This is what happens when God intervenes in the healing. It's so often not a gradual thing. It's like Peter's mother-in-law. When Jesus takes away her fever, she not only gets up feeling whooped because she just had a fever, she gets up feeling so totally refreshed that she goes out and starts making dinner for everybody. That's the kind of healing we get when God intervenes. And what does God get for his trouble? Well, what's Peter talking about right here? This man was raised up by Jesus. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. That's the way people treat God. That's the way people treat Jesus. That's the world in its sinful, rebellious finest. They had their choice. The righteous Jesus, Pilate himself, the Roman governor, who had judged many crimes. Even after grilling Jesus, he might have been puzzled by him. He might not have believed anything about him. He might not have seen anything about who Jesus truly was, but he could see that Jesus was not guilty of anything that he was being accused of. Maybe he was deluded, maybe it was true, maybe he was sent from heaven above, but he wasn't a rebellious, murderous sort of guy who needed to die on the cross. But the crowd persisted. They said, give us Barabbas, give us the insurrectionist, give us the one who killed people during the rebellion. Now, probably some of the people were happy that folks had died at the hand of Barabbas because quite likely they were either... Romans or people who were conspiring with the Romans. That's who you rebelled against back then. But still, to take a guy whose biggest crime to date was just down the road, only a few miles, almost at the foot of Mount Zion, it's so close, in Bethany when he said, Lazarus, come out. And after four days dead in the tomb, Lazarus came out. 
That's crimes before that. Feeding hungry people, healing lame people, granting hearing to the deaf and sight to the blind. And the crowd said, well, we'll trade all of that in for the murderer. Give us Barabbas. You keep Jesus. Kill him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. It's kind of interesting that it all works out the way it does. Barabbas actually means the son of the father. So you have two people who are representative sons of their fathers standing up there with Pilate. You have the son of God, the father almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The son who we confess in our creeds. The son we sing about. The son we believe in. And then you also had the son, not only of his earthly father, but of the father of lies. The father of iniquity. A son of Satan himself. And the crowd says, give us that one. You keep Jesus. The leaders couldn't abide the way Jesus was preaching and teaching and leading people away from their teachings, and they wanted to get rid of him. Whether or not he caused the rebellion was really irrelevant. It was that people trusted him. People believed in him. Give us the murderer. And Pilate did. But there's an interesting selection that's going on here. Even as we, a lot of times, for all the wrong reasons, make the wrong choices, we may not choose to have our murderer set free in our midst, but we choose poorly. Often in the sight of God, and quite often even in the sight of one another. How many times have you rolled your eyes or sighed or even said something when you saw so-and-so was dating that person? Or was engaged to that person? Or are you going, where to school? Or whatever it is. Judge, judge, judge. But they choose it. And how many times were you the one who made the stupid choice? The foolish choice. Even the sinful choice because it's what you wanted. It's what felt good to you. It's what satisfied your wants and your needs. Because if you're not trusting in God, then you are finally your God. And you're the judge and jury of everything. And every time we choose that way, in a way we are also choosing the murderer. We're choosing the sinful path. We're choosing the adulterer, the cheat, the thief, the one who engages the belly before brain or heart, the one who stays away from faith, the one who we are by birth. As I said, there's an interesting thing that's going on here because even as the crowd chooses the murderer, God also does. Because in allowing Jesus to suffer and die, he allows him who the scriptures say, who knew no sin to be sin, to become sin for us. He is the murderer, Barabbas, as he stands there under the judgment of the crowd and soon under, under Pilate. He is these scoffers gathered around at the temple. He's denying Peter. He's the traitor Judas. He's those cowards who scurried out of the garden, fearful for their own lives. He's not only David at his finest, but David as he wallows in his sin with Bathsheba. And David's son Absalom rebelling against that throne. He's Adam, he's Eve, he's Abel, and he's Cain. And he's you. And all of your sins, all of your faults, all of your shortcomings... And God says, give me the murderer, give me the thief, give me the liar, give me the cheat, give me the lazy bum, give me the one who always makes the wrong decisions for the wrong reason, who thinks about self above everything else. Give me that one. You can have the righteous one. God chose you. And he let the Holy One suffer and die on the cross. God chose you. Above the one who could stand outside a tomb and say, Lazarus, come out and have his request granted. The one who could stand there looking at a crowd of over 5,000 hungry people and with just a handful of bread and fish, feed all of them. God chose the one who led Peter and James and John up a hill and glorified himself and shone so brightly the disciples couldn't look on him and conversed with the long gone Moses and the long gone Elijah. And chose to send him to the cross. 
said, I don't want him because he is coated with sin. He is covered with sin. He is full of the iniquity of the entire world, stained completely. In the Father's eyes, in a way, Jesus looks like he does to the rest of the world when Isaiah talks about how he has been beaten and tortured so much that he's hardly recognizable as a man. Spiritually, that's Jesus in the Father's eyes. Carrying every one of your sins and evils and wickednesses. Everything wrong about you by nature, by birth, and by action. By thought and by word. As well as by deed. All that plaster to Jesus like one of those telephone poles in the city where they've laid poster after poster after poster on top without taking anything off. And you have all those layers. Or like some house where they just kept putting up new wallpaper without taking off the old. And you look down through the layers and you can't find anything behind it. It's just battered layer after ugly layer after hideous layer of something. God says, kill that one and give me Barabbas. Give me Cain and Abel. Give me Isaiah and Ahaz. Give me Peter and James and John and give me Judas. Give me all who have sinned against me and let him die. Now granted, not all of those who sinned against him, not all those who doubted, who disbelieved, who went against him, not all of those who raised up voices or hands against Jesus ever believed and were ever saved, but in Jesus, they were given that gift. If they denied it, if they turned their backs on it, if they said, we don't want it, if they washed their hands of it, as Pilate did, of his perceived guilt in the whole proceedings, Jesus still died for them. He still loved them that much. The Father still loved them that much, and the Father loves you that much. So when we hear the rebuke, that Peter lays on the crowd, we have to remember that we also were the ones who given our own volition in that said, well, let somebody else suffer. Let somebody else feel the pain. I don't want it. But Jesus did. Not because he enjoyed the pain, but because he loved you. This isn't a parole where we're released into the world in hopes that things will turn out right. This is a complete pardon. The slate is entirely wiped clean. The trial is overthrown. The judgment has vanished. We are not only released on our own recognizance or released with an ankle bracelet, but we are released and we are free. No guilt is attached to us. Us. You and me, we the people who would have gathered and said, crucify him if we would have had the opportunity or would have at least hidden ourselves away because of fear of everybody else. We are free because God chose us to live and chose his son to die. And that's the power then that is in that name when Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. And in the name of Jesus Christ, God tells you to rise up in your baptism, in your daily life. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is God saying to you, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Rise up and be free to be the person that God wants you to be and that in faith you want to be. Not a murderer, not a rebel, not a thief or a liar, not an adulterer, not a shameful person in any way, but someone who mirrors the Savior who suffered and died for you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus, you are freed of your sins. And you know it took, you know it's complete because Jesus himself rose up on the third day and came out of the tomb and showed himself to the disciples over 500 people saw their Savior living and breathing before them after he was raised from the dead. They saw the wounds for themselves. Maybe they broke bread and ate fish with him also. And they realized that their sins, which were many, 
were completely covered over. The exchange, God works. He does trade a righteous one for a murderer, but not always in the way that we think. Because when Jesus says, it is finished, that rebellious, murderous Barabbas had all of his sin taken away. As did Pilate. As did the high priest and the Jewish council who voted against him. And Mary, and Mary, and Mary, and Salome, and Peter, and James, and John. All of them. And you. God chose the murderers. God chose the rebels. God chose the cheats and the liars to be his own. And chose his son to pay the cost. So if you're tempted to look down your nose at others and think that they're a worse sinner or a bigger crook than you or anyone else you know, remember that we're all redeemed, we're all pardoned, and we're all saved because by nature, we're the ones who deserve to be punished, not Jesus. But we don't get what we deserve. We get what we get. That's peace and joy and life everlasting. And finally, a healing that even the lame man there at the temple could only barely begin to imagine. Because eventually he was going to get old and start creaking and groaning and slowing down and finally die. But when that final healing comes for you and me, there ain't going to be any stopping us forever and ever and ever. What a beautiful trade God worked out completely to your advantage. In Jesus' name, amen. That peace that surpasses understanding keep you in the same Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.